All right, good morning, everybody. Once again, I'm Sarah Moraes, and I'm here hosting the Vertical Measures monthly webinar series. I'm very excited to introduce our guest presenter today, Jay Baer. He is the co-author of The Now Revolution and founder of Convince and Convert. Today's webinar is titled Why Before How? Seven Steps to Create Winning Social Media Strategies. Before we get started, please allow me to take care of a little housekeeping. Today's webinar will be available for replay, assuming there are no technical difficulties. We will notify you via email when that is available. And Jay will be happy to answer your questions at the end of the webinar, so please make sure to ask them in the chat applet located on your screen. And if you are having trouble uh, seeing or hearing, please attempt to reconnect. So without further ado, uh, Jay Bear. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thanks to everybody for joining us today for Why Before How, Seven Steps to Create Winning Social Media Strategies. Hashtag for today's webinar is SM7Steps, and on Twitter I am at Jay Bear. Social media is now the most popular activity online. More time is spent uh, on social media and social networking than on email uh, and web browsing combined. And the question becomes, why? Don't we have anything better to do with our time than mess around in social media? And, and the answer is that we spend this kind of time because social media gives us power. It gives us power over our relationships with one another, and it gives us power over our relationships with businesses. Social networks close the gaps between us. My co-author, Amber Naslin, said a really interesting thing to me once when I interviewed her years ago. She said, what I like about social networks is that it sets it up so that my friends, my relationships, are no longer dictated by geography or by circumstance. And that's exactly right. Social media and social networks make the world a lot smaller, and that's very, very intoxicating and attractive to us. A few years ago, I wrote a blog post about the National Hockey League. This was before the NHL got good at social media. And they had some new TV commercials that came out. And I wrote a blog post that said, you know, these are great TV commercials, but there's no social media component at all. This is a real missed opportunity, because nobody is as passionate as hockey fans. And I posted a link to the blog post on Twitter. And about 90 minutes later, I got this post. Read your blog on the NHL ads with interest. Intend to discuss it internally. It's not 100% on the mark, but warrants a talk. Turns out that guy was, and still is, the vice president of communications for the NHL. So we end up getting on the phone and talking it through. That doesn't happen in the real world. It can't happen in the real world. Social media and social networks makes the world a much smaller place. And for businesses, it changes the way that we market and communicate fundamentally. Right? The history of marketing since the very beginning has essentially been archery. Let's find a target audience and unilaterally send messages out at that target. Hopefully we hit them and they buy stuff from us. Now, marketing is much more like ping pong than it is about marketing. It's much more about marketing with people instead of marketing at them. Some of you may have seen this graphic or versions of this graphic in the past. It's called the conversation prism. And it purports to show all the different places that companies could ostensibly interact with their customers and prospective customers across the social web, far beyond your obvious Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+. It's all the other places that you could conceivably interact. And the problem is this is the wrong way to think about it. This type of graphic should scare you, because this type of graphic emphasizes the tools, the tactics, the minutia of social media. And that's not the way I want you to think. The tools always change. The only thing that's true about digital marketing is that the tools always change. This is a graphic that shows the share of search in the US in 1999. Yahoo had approximately 66% of the search business. Number two was Excite, number three Alta Vista, then InfoSeq, and Lycos. Anybody use their Lycos toolbar lately? I presume not. Now there's a company that some of you may use to search for stuff today, something Google, that's not actually on this chart. And I can tell you, I started in digital marketing in 1994, and I can tell you firsthand 
that in 1999, we thought this game was over. Yahoo has won. The search game is all done. And Google comes along with a better mousetrap, and boom, takes over the game. So much so that in December of last year, Yahoo sold the smoking wreckage of their, smoke bit of their search business uh, to Bing for like $10 in a chicken sandwich. They basically just, please, take, take, take it away from us. So Yahoo went from a 66% share of the search business to a 0% share of the search business in 11 years, which is hard to do on purpose, much less accidentally. The tools always change. Lots of talk this week about Google+, including some by me. I'm a big advocate for it. I think it's really uh, doing something correctly. The tools always change. I don't have a slide for this because I just looked it up yesterday, but already, two weeks into it, Google Plus is generating 25% as much traffic to my blog than Twitter is. And I've been doing Twitter for four years and Google Plus for 14 days, and it's 25% as much already. The tools always change. If you fall in love with the tools and your social media strategy is rooted in what is our plan for Facebook, you don't actually have a strategy at all. What you have is a recipe for playing a constant game of catch up. So what I want you to do is worry about how to be social first and worry less about how to do social media. And to help companies think through this process, I put together the seven step strategic planning methodology that many, many corporations and agencies are using all over North America. I do a lot of consulting around this exact process to help you think about the big picture social media strategy and not get sort of intoxicated by the specific tool-centric notion that is so prevalent out there today. So the first step in this process is to build an arc. Recognize that social media impacts your business universally in ways that nothing else does. Anything that happens to your company, good or bad, operationally, customer service, finance, legal, CEO gets a DUI, anything that happens in your company manifests itself first in social media. Before the first email comes, before the first phone call comes, it'll find itself present in social media. So social media has a widespread impact on your business, and so you need to have a cross-functional group of people in your organization managing your social media strategy. You want to build an arc somebody from marketing, somebody from customer service, somebody from operations, somebody from legal, somebody from finance, to put together some social media strategic planning. Okay? It isn't just a marketing question. People ask all the time. They ask me and other social media strategists, who should own social media in our organization? Maybe you've asked that question. The answer is everybody. Nobody owns social media, and everybody owns social media. So put together a team in your company, a Noah's Ark approach, cross-functional team to help put this strategy together. The second step in this process is to listen. People are already talking shit about you online. Already. Whether you choose to believe it or not, people are already talking about your company and your competitors right now. So you need to tap into those conversations before you go out there and start flapping your gums. So use listening tools, whether they're free or paid, to figure out what's being said about you and use that information to help dictate your downstream social media strategy. The third step in this process is to understand what really is the point. What is the point of being involved in social media? There is no law, at least not yet, no law that says your company needs to be involved in social media. And it's not a free ride. Social media is not inexpensive. It's different expensive. It takes considerable manpower to do social media well. It is not an insignificant investment. So if your company is going to make that investment, you have to understand why that investment is being made. What are you trying to accomplish? And there's a lot of individual and specific use cases for social media for different companies, but I think really there's just three main reasons why you might use social media in your organization. The first is awareness. Let's use social media to make people aware of us who previously were not aware of us, our company, our product, our service. Second option is sales. Let's use social media to translate existing awareness into sales. Things like Facebook commerce, things like 
uh, group buying deals, things like Twitter only offers, right? Let's use social media to drive sales. And the third option is loyalty. Let's use social media to stay on the radar of people who have already bought from us. Let's turn our customers into advocates. Awareness, sales, loyalty. You really need to pick one of those. You need to say, this is our prime directive for social media. Because once you understand how it fits into your overall business strategy, it becomes much easier to understand what you're going to do tactically down the road. And you have to realize that every customer or prospective customer that you have in the whole world already has some sort of relationship with you that can be plotted on this continuum. Okay, so on the far left is unaware, people who have never heard of you. Second step is aware. They've heard of you, but they've never done business with you. The third step is trial. They've tried you or they've done business with you once, but not on a continual basis. Fourth step are the repeat and enthusiastic customers. And the last step on the far right-hand side is the holy grail, right? It's advocacy. It's where your customers become voluntary marketers. And the whole point of marketing, actually the whole point of business, is to move people from the left to the right on this continuum. Now, let's think about this continuum through the context of a brand that we might be familiar with. Okay, Pontiac. Now for me, in terms of Pontiac, I'm aware. Okay? I have never owned a Pontiac. And I've never, really hardly ever, driven a Pontiac. Maybe a, a, a rental car or something like that, but not a lot. So I would be in that awareness category for Pontiac. Maybe trial, but probably awareness. Now I suspect there are people on this webinar who have had a Pontiac in the past. And maybe some of you who even have uh, a Pontiac right now, but probably not a lot. Okay? Pontiac as a brand is no longer viable because they didn't successfully move people from the left to the right on this continuum. You had Pontiac drivers, but you never really had Pontiac advocates, not since the, the sort of muscle car days, uh, GTOs and, and, and the real heyday. Now, I used to live in Arizona. I lived in Arizona for 40 years, which is how I came to know the good folks at, at Vertical Measures in Phoenix. And in Arizona, everybody's got a pickup, right? It's, it, everybody's got it. It's crazy. Lots of trucks. And if you have a Chevy truck, you almost invariably, and Sarah will back me up on this, you almost invariably in your back window have the piss on Ford sticker. <laughs> it's like standard factory equipment, right? It just comes with. And if you have a Ford truck, you always have the piss on Chevy sticker, right? Same thing. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen a piss on Pontiac sticker? You have not. I looked it up. The problem with Pontiac is that nobody cares enough about it to even piss on it. That's the problem. That's the whole point of what you're trying to do in social media and in business is get people psyched about your business. So the fourth step in this process is to analyze your audiences, figure out what can you do to get them psyched. Who are they? What levers do you need to push and pull to get them psyched, to get them to put a sticker on their car, metaphorically speaking? First part of this analysis is to really understand who are these people? Age, gender, geography, who are they? How do they use social media? This is where you might put together um, customer personas, if people are familiar with that concept. David Meerman Scott's talked about it a lot in his books. Um, certainly in the, in the web usability world, we talk about personas a lot, customer experience, creating fake real people to help you understand the motivations of your customers, very helpful in this process. So how do these people use social media? And that's an important point, because the social media audience and its behaviors are by no means homogenous. There's, what, 750 million people on Facebook now? You can't say, here's how people on Facebook behave when it's like the third largest country in the world. That's crazy. That's like saying, here's how people in America behave, or here's how people in Arizona behave, or even here's how people on this webinar behave. So I use Forrester's social technographics ladder for this process. And the, the social technographics ladder is essentially a very fancy way of saying the way that people use social media report. 
And Forrester separates the social media audience into seven rungs on this ladder. And the reason they, they use a ladder metaphor is that at the top are people who are more participatory, and on the bottom are people who are less participatory. Now, you math majors uh, in the audience may notice that the percentages of these rungs add up to well more than 100%. That's because people can and are uh, on multiple rungs of this ladder. So I'll walk you through this quickly because some people may not have seen this in the past. I know some of you may have. At the top are creators. That's 24% of the people in America who have an internet access capability. Creators are people like me who publish a blog, who upload videos, who you know write articles on sites, those kind of things. Right? They make content. That's creators. Conversationalists are your status update freaks. Right? So your Twitter, your Facebook, your Google+, here's what I'm doing, I'm eating pizza, that's 33%. Critics, 37%. That's your Yelp people, your TripAdvisor, your Amazon reviews, your iTunes reviews, people who don't have a blog but are happy to tell you how much your blog sucks. That's the 37% critics group. Collectors are 20%, and that number stays the same year after year, never moves, always 20% for collectors. And those are sort of your librarians. Shout out to my friend Mike Burns, who actually is a librarian and who is uh, on this call. 20% are collectors, librarians. They, they sort of tag, they curate. So they're tagging pages. They're using RSS feeds. That's kind of your stumble, dig, delicious type group. Joiners are 59%. Those are people who have a social networking profile but don't do a lot with it, right? So my mom. My mom's on Facebook but barely uses it people who have a LinkedIn profile but don't really do much else. That's that 59% in the uh, joiners category. Spectators is 70%. Those are the people who consume the content that the creators create, right? So people who watch videos, read blogs, look at photos on Flickr, listen to podcasts, etc. And 17% of the people in the US who have an internet account are inactive. They don't do any of those things, which is hard to fathom, right? 17% of the people in America who are online have never watched a video, have never read a blog post, have never looked at a photo on Flickr, have never seen Facebook. Those people are Amish or want to be Amish. 17% of the folks out there are involved in none of this. So this is important because you can map your audience demographics to social technographics. So if you know that your target audience, in this case is 35 to 44 year old Canadians who are female, the Forrester tool that they have online will show you what percentage uh, of that uh, group are creators and critics and collectors and spectators and joiners. That's good because we're not all Steven Spielberg. But you would think that we are, because every company in the world that says, hey, you know what we should do? Let's have a video contest, and we'll ask our fans to create videos for us, and they'll send them in. It's going to be awesome. We're going to get all kinds of engagement. And the reality is not everybody is comfortable making a video, much less making a video on behalf of your brand that they only care about marginally. Okay? So let me show you how this works in practice. About three years ago, Doritos, for the first time ever, set up a program where if you created your own TV commercial, submitted it to their website, they had a voting process. And the commercial that got the most votes, they actually ran as their Super Bowl commercial. The one that, that was the victor the first year they did it was the one where the guy had the snow globe, threw it through the snack machine, grabbed Doritos, and then turned and threw it again and hit his boss in the groin. It was pretty funny. It actually won the USA Today Super Bowl ad meter, for whatever that's worth. And it worked out pretty good, right? This is the first time I'd ever done it. They put together this program. They got 1,961 contest entries. Okay? Now, a few months later, Jim Beam did a similar program. Make us a commercial, you win a big prize, etc. In fact, Jim Beam made it a little bit easier to participate because they gave potential entrants um, some video snippets and a couple of examples to go by. It wasn't just a blank sheet of paper the way Doritos did. They made it a little bit easier to play, and Jim Beam got 300 entries. 1,961 entries 
versus 300 entries. Pretty big difference, right? Now let's take a look at the social technographics of those audiences. Top, Doritos, 18 to 24 year old men in the US. 41% of that audience are creators, and it indexes at 200. Some of you who work in the media business know what index means. It speaks to composition. So 100 represents the average US adult. So an index of 200 means that 18 to 24 year old men are twice as likely as any adult to be creators, twice as likely. 41% indexes at 200. Look at the bottom, Jim Beam's audience, 45 to, 50 year old, 45 to 54 year old men in the US, 14% creators, 67% index, meaning that they are one third less likely than average to be creators. So if you ask somebody to make you a video, the people who will make you a video are creators. One brand has 41% of their audience is like, yeah, that's, I'm cool with that. Other brand has 14%. 1,961 entries, 300 entries. It's not an accident, okay? A lot of what succeeds in social media is based on giving your audience appropriate assignments. Appropriate assignments. The fifth step in the strategic planning process is to understand what's your one thing. Now, I didn't take this picture. This picture was sent to, be my, uh, sent to me by my friend DJ Waldo. But I can tell you, even having not been here when this photo was taken, that if you asked 100 people what is noteworthy about this guy, approximately 96 would say mullet. Right? This guy is committed to the mullet. If you look up the term rocking a mullet, this guy uh, will appear photographically. You can see he even has this special sort of muscle shirt that frames the mullet, almost like an art gallery. Right? It's fantastic. This guy is all about the mullet. That is his one thing. That is what he is known for. Amongst all his friends, he's mullet guy. You have to figure out for your company what is your mullet. Because here's the thing. We are in an era of the invitation avalanche. Every company of every size and description is running the same playbook, which is be my friend, follow me on Twitter, look at my video, read my blog, download my white paper, blah, 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 blah. And as consumers, as citizens, it is too much. It is an invitation avalanche. And if every company in the world has a special offer, what makes your offer so special? It's an invitation avalanche. And the way you break through that is to focus on the heart, not the head. You have to realize that passion is the fuel of social media. Passion is the thing that makes somebody spend their own money to tattoo their logo on you, their arm or get a piss on sticker. Okay? It's about passion. It's not about bullet points. Okay? You know what this is? It's branding. This is just branding. It's branding for the new world. Apple's not about computers or phones. Apple's about innovation. Disney's not about movies or theme parks. Disney's about magic. Volvo doesn't sell cars. Volvo sells safety. Ritz Carlton isn't about hotels. It's about service. What are you about? What's on the other side of the equal sign for your brand? Because until you figure that out, no one is going to get psyched about your brand. No one is going to go out of their way to become an advocate for a brand that doesn't understand what makes it worthy of advocacy. It's not about bullet points. It's not about features and benefits. It's about something bigger and deeper than that. A few years ago, there's a company in Stockholm, Sweden, small digital agency. They got assigned a project to do social media for Heinz Ketchup. And that's not exactly an extremely awesome assignment because what are you going to do with that, right? What are you going to, what, what's your focus? We're more tomato-y, right? Viscosity. We got the squeeze bottle. I mean, it doesn't, it, there's not a whole lot to go on. But these guys did a really interesting thing. They put together this program called Talk to the Plant talktotheplant.com. It was based on the premise, and I'm sure all of you have heard, that if you talk to your plants, they'll grow bigger and hardier and faster and stronger. And they put it to the test. They took two tomato plants, 
grew them in the exact same way. Same soil, same water, same light, same temperature. They hired the director of botany, uh, or the professor of botany, or whatever it is, at the University of Stockholm to supervise the experiment, make sure it was on the up and up. It was totally the same, except the one on the left, you could go to this website and type in the box any message. And using a text speech translator and a microphone and a speaker, you could talk to the plant. So you say, hello, plant. I'm on the vertical measures webinar. Right? And it would actually talk to the plant in Sweden. And 19,530 people actually took the time to talk to this plant, which may say more about the people of Sweden than it does about the social media program, but that's for a webinar for another day. Almost 20,000 people participated. And they had lab notes to describe how they did it. It was all fully realized. Now, unfortunately, the results were inconclusive. The, the plant that was spoken to actually did grow bigger, but apparently not in a statistically valid way or something like that. But the point is not the result. The point is how they created the social media program. Now, you can see that this is by Heinz. Got a logo in the corner, logo in the middle. But that's it. That's all there is about Heinz. Right? There's no buy one pack of hot dogs, get free buns, you know, buy ketchup, get mustard, summer grilling recipes. It's not a come on, right? Because it's not really about ketchup. It's about where ketchup comes from. It's about the fact that ketchup isn't made, it's grown. You can't walk through the fields and pick ketchup bottles off a ketchup bottle tree, although you would think that you can because it's such a commoditized product, right? It's everywhere. Nothing is as commoditized as ketchup, perhaps. And these guys turned the table on it. They made you realize that, you know what? It comes from tomatoes, and people grow tomatoes. And actually, after this program, Heinz adopted this as their global brand positioning. If you've seen any of their TV commercials, a lot of them now feature farmers, actual farmers, who grow tomatoes to make Heinz ketchup. Hi, I'm Bob, and this is my son, Jimmy, and we grow tomatoes, and we've grown tomatoes for 30 years for Heinz Ketchup, but we're so proud to be part of America's Table, blah, blah, blah. The tagline underneath the Heinz logo on ketchup, check it out next time you see one, grown, not made. Okay? They understand that it's not about ketchup. It's about where ketchup comes from. And that idea didn't come from some giant Madison Avenue ad agency. It came from a six-person interactive agency in Stockholm who understood the power of the one thing, who understood what Heinz's mullet really was. Now, finding this one thing isn't easy. right? It's not a piece of cake to figure this out. If it was, every company would be Apple or Nordstrom or Volvo or, or Heinz, right? and we're not. It requires a measure of anthropology to figure this out, right? to observe your company, to find these special moments. Because we're too close to it, right? You sit in a conference room and say, what's special about us? You'd never come up with good answers. You're way too close to it. When I was a kid, my first job was as an intern in Phoenix at a public relations firm. And one of our clients was Rockford Fosgate. And Rockford was and still is a manufacturer of car stereo speakers and amplifiers. And we went on a factory tour, uh, which is a good practice, right? I mean, you're going to learn more be it out and about than you will in your conference room. And we went on a factory tour. And they had the assembly line there. And at the end of the assembly line was a guy that looks kind of like this. I don't have the actual photo anymore, but he was like 6'4", 250, long gray beard, ponytail, but wearing a white lab coat and carrying a giant rubber mallet. It was like a Top Chef Hell's Angels kind of a mashup. And he was at the end, and amplifiers come down the assembly line, and he takes it and puts it over on like a sawhorse table kind of deal and takes the mallet and starts beating on the amplifiers, like bam, 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 bam. And then he plugs it in, and if the light turns green, he puts it in a box and like down the rolling conveyor belt. So we're standing there with the marketing director, and we're like, so is he always here? Or is it just the agency day, or what's the story? And she says, totally matter of fact, oh no, that's, uh, that's Bob. He's our quality control process because our customers are primarily young men, and they drive their vehicles very aggressively. They hit curbs and jump dips and that kind of thing, and we want to make sure that their amplifier connections stay tight, because if they don't, it's a terrible brand experience. You have to take up your carpet and lift up your seat and all that and plug it back in. It's a hassle. So we want to make sure those connections are tight, and Bob is the mechanism 
by which we ensure that. I'm like, what? This is crazy. Now, this predates social media by, I don't even know, 15 years or something. But even back then, they let us build a whole campaign around it called Rockford Fosgate. If we can't whale it, we fail it. And just a picture of Bob holding his mallet with a story that told his story. And it was terrifically successful. Because if you've ever seen a car stereo ad, then or now, they are all exactly the same. Picture of the product, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, next column, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, web address, phone number. Bullet points do not get people psyched. Features of your product are not a mullet. When we asked the marketing director before the tour, hey, tell us what's special about Rockford Fosgate, you know what she told us? She said, we make amplifiers in five sizes, and our competitors only make them in three. And meanwhile, you've got a guy with a rubber mallet on your assembly line. It's really hard to see what's special about yourself, which is why your customers and your agency can help in this mullet identification process. Sixth step in this process is to build a home base and outposts. One of the big mistakes that a lot of companies fall into is this idea that they want to be good at everything in social media. We want to have a good Twitter program and a good Facebook program and a good YouTube program and a good blog and a good LinkedIn page and a good Google Plus program and a good Flickr program. Really? Do you really? What you've got to do instead is figure out which thing in social media is the place where you can ideally interact with customers and prospects. Which venue is the one that's used by most of your customers and prospects? And which venue gives you the best chance to actually interact with them in a way that either makes you money, saves you money, or both? Right? The problem with Facebook, and a lot of companies use Facebook as their uh, sort of most important social media outlet, is that you're building a house on rented land. Right? You're not really interacting with customers in a place that you control, which is a little bit risky long term. So what you want to do is pick one. Pick one place, your social media home base, that you ideally want to interact with customers upon. And then what you do is you take your other social media activities, your outposts, and you primarily use them to drive people back to your home base. Right? It is a circle. It is a hub and spoke. So in my case, okay, what I do on Twitter and Facebook and now Google Plus and LinkedIn and YouTube drives people to my blog. My blog is my home base. That's what I'm trying to do. I want you to come to my blog because if you're on my blog, I can get you to sign up for my email newsletter. I can show you that I'm a social media speaker and that you can hire me to speak at your event. I can sell you a book. I can sell you consulting services. It's very difficult to do any of those things on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube. Okay? So for me, the blog is the home base. Everything else drives people back to the blog. You need to figure out what is your home base and outpost ecosystem. And here's how that ecosystem can look in practice. This is uh, one that we did for an actual client where Facebook, in their case, was uh, the core for a lot of different reasons. They had a big audience there already. So Facebook is sort of the, the key for them. And then other things that they're doing, mobile and locations, or a Foursquare program, their email accounts, website, Twitter, blog, YouTube, it all sort of feeds back to Facebook. And there is some promotion of other outposts within other outposts. But, but Facebook is in the middle. That is their ecosystem. So you should put together that same kind of diagram for your company. It will give everybody in the organization a lot more clarity about what you're trying to do day to day. Now the last step in this process is to pick success metrics. Okay? You have to understand whether or not this is a smart investment for your company. Right? Because otherwise you, you do social media for six months and then somebody says, hey, how's that working? You're like, I don't know, it feels pretty good. We got a bunch of fans. Right? That's not really a success metric. Okay? You've got to do better than that. So let's talk about metrics a little bit. There are three categories of metrics okay, that match the three strategic imperatives. So if you are trying to use social media for awareness, there are metrics to measure that. If you're trying to use social media for sales, there's metrics to measure that. 
If you're trying to use social media to generate loyalty amongst your customers, there's metrics to measure that. Okay, so the metrics that you employ are different based on the strategy you employ. Okay, makes sense, right? So here's some things that you want to do. Okay, one is track social specific actions, not just aggregation. So here's an example from my friends at California Tortilla. California Tortilla is a chain of Mexican food restaurants, um, actually as far as I know with no locations in California, which I think is fraud at some level. They're actually based in Baltimore, home of authentic Mexican food. But they do a, a really good job in social media tracking social specific action. So in this case, this is a Facebook status update. Hi there, Facebookers. It is a secret password day. Say fresh and get a free chips and queso with any burrito purchase. Okay, so before this goes on the, on the wall, they tell their store managers, hey, the password's gonna be fresh. Store managers tells all the kids working the cash register, the password is gonna be fresh. Somebody walks into a California tortilla and says, fresh, and they give them a free chips and queso with any burrito purchased. They code it into the cash register like a coupon because it is, in fact, an audio coupon. That gets reported up through their point of sale system and they can run data that says, here's how many of these were redeemed, here's which were redeemed the most at which store, etc. Now you can also say, okay, on Facebook the password is fresh, and on Twitter the password is salsa, and on Google Plus the password is sombrero, right? And you could determine the impact of each of those social outposts on your actual in-store traffic, okay? Now, is that hard to do? Well, it's kind of hard to do because you have to coordinate it with a lot of people. But even for smaller businesses, I used to be on the board of a, of a tiny theater company in Flagstaff, Arizona before I moved to Indiana. And we did this all the time, right? If we had unsold tickets, we put on Facebook and Twitter, come to the box office and say the password Jane or whoever one of the main characters in that play was. And if people came to the box office and said that secret password, we gave them two for one tickets. But just like California Tortilla, we didn't talk about that password anywhere else except in social media. So we knew specifically what social media's impact was on ticket sales. Okay? Now, that's not impossible by any stretch of the imagination. And it is a heck of a lot better than just counting fans. Okay? You're counting behavior, which always is better than aggregating individuals. Here's an example for Sweet Leaf Tea. Sweet Leaf Tea is an emerging beverage brand based in Austin. They have pretty good distribution now. I'm sure some of you have seen it, but they're not all over the country. They're owned by Nestle now. And we did a project with them a while back where we were trying to get more shelf space because like a lot of beverage brands, they've got tons of flavors, but most stores only carry the top two or three flavors. So we wanted to get more shelf space. So we put together this PDF which just says, hey, dear shopkeeper, I shop here. I love Sweet Leaf Tea. Carry these flavors. Checkbox, checkbox, checkbox put it on the Facebook page, put it in the email newsletter, and asked our fans to download it, print it out, take it into their favorite store. Had about 500 downloads. Two weeks later, sales guys are coming back to the office saying, man, all these stores are asking us now for half and half and diet citrus green tea and raspberry iced tea. What's going on? You know what that took? It took an hour. It took one hour to create a PDF. We gave fans an appropriate assignment and created a program where we could measure behavior, not just aggregation. A lot of people ask about social media ROI. And you can absolutely measure ROI. It's easier to measure it if you're an e-commerce company. It's easier to measure it if you're doing some sort of trackable coupon like California Tortilla. But you can, you can do it regardless if you want to work hard enough at it. But because it takes a lot of work, and because perhaps you don't have that level of analytics capabilities in your company, what you can do instead is measure correlation. Okay? The way you measure correlation is that you track a number of things over a relatively long period of time. So in this particular case, right, we're measuring new customers, which is the revenue part of it. We're measuring Facebook fans, social mentions, RSS subscribers, inbound links. You measure those for six months, we see in this chart, and what you're looking for, as you see in the black box, are simultaneous increases. 
So hey, when we started to get more new fans, or new customers, I should say, we were also doing better in social media. As revenue went up, so did social behaviors. As repeat customers went up, so did social mentions or positive Yelp reviews or whatever you're going to track. Now, does that mean that social media caused that increase? No, it doesn't mean that. You cannot prove that. You cannot prove that one thing led to the other thing. But what you can say is that they are correlated, that they happen simultaneously. Therefore, there is some effect there. Something fishy is going on. Okay? So if you can't put together an actual ROI story, everybody should be measuring correlation. There is no excuse for you not to do this. Pick five or six success metrics that make sense, even three, and measure them over a longer period of time and look for these simultaneous patterns. Now, measure. In fact, in my book, we talk about 26 specific success metrics that you might use for your company, depending on whether you're focused on awareness, sales, or loyalty. 26 metrics. Now, you cannot measure, nor should you measure, 26 different things. Number one, it takes too long, right? What's the ROI of calculating ROI becomes the question at some point. So you don't want to track 26 things. One, it takes too long. Two, you start getting all kinds of conflicting numbers, and it drives everybody crazy. Okay, so we advocate pick three numbers, right? Pick three numbers that you believe in, that you think make sense, um, that are not crazy, uh, and, and track those out over a period of time and see how well you believe it articulates what you're doing as a company in social media. And if you've got to throw one overboard and pick a different metric after that, fine. Okay? But don't say we're going to track everything that we can track, because in some cases, less is more. I want you to remember this. The goal is not to be good at social media. The goal is to be good at business because of social media. Okay? There is no prize for having the most Facebook fans or the most Twitter followers. How are you going to become a better, more profitable company with all these Facebook fans that you're accumulating? Right? You have to understand what the end game is and not get caught up in the means to the end. That's the seven-step process for social media strategic planning. There's actually a free worksheet on my site that you can download that kind of walks you through those steps. If you like, convinceandconvert.com. Uh, there's my book, Now Revolution. I'd love for you to take a look at it if you haven't already, available in all your bookstores and Kindle and iBooks and Nook and all that kind of stuff. The website for the book is nowrevolutionbook.com. And I am at Jay Bear, and I think we've got some time for questions. Yeah, I think we do. Thank you, Jay, so much. Uh, very entertaining presentation. There's a lot of talk about mullets going on on Twitter right now. Perfect. That hashtag is SM7Steps, so feel free to answer the questions however you'd like. There's a few in the chat applet, uh, which I think that you can see as well, and there are some on Twitter. We take any audio questions, or we just do it in the chat? Um, I think that it'll just be through the chat and on Twitter. Okay. Great, then I will take care of that. Then I or you will log can... off the phone, if you like. Or do you want me to, or you want me to read them and do them that way? Yeah, part? you can go ahead and read them. We okay. have some time to answer them verbally. Okay. I'm not actually seeing them on the Oh, you're not? Okay, yeah, I can read some off for you. Okay, go for it, yeah. Just All right, uh, so we have a question. Besides Google Alerts, how does one find out what's being said about their company? Great question. Um, on, there's a number of free listening software programs that you might use. In fact, um, uh, we have a link in the book to a whole list of like 15 or 20 free ones. Um, I like Social Mention, at socialmention.com. Um, that's a pretty good one. Uh, I also, for real-time stuff, to say, hey, what's being said about us right now? Uh, I like Currently, with a K, K-U-R-R-E-N-T-L-Y.com. For inexpensive social media listening, um, so better than free, but but not as comprehensive as sort of your market leaders like Radium Six or uh, people like that. Uh, I like Viral Heat, viralheat.com. Uh, that's uh, just a few dollars a month. Does a nice job. Another one I like, which is also inexpensive uh, and is very good, especially if you're good at Excel, because it's sort of an Excel-based program. is called Row Feeder. R O W Feeder.com. 
All right, great. And then you just put in keywords, right? So you put in your what you want to do is you want to search for your brand name, your product names, your competitors' names, their product names, your executive names, you know, search terms that um, uh, describe your industry. You want to search for all that stuff, and you'll find what's going on out there. All right, great. Thanks for those tools. Um, and of course, I'm sure that there's a lot more in your book, The Now Revolution. I'm trying to see if there's few other questions we can get to on Twitter. Um, not that I can see, but uh, but yeah, again, hashtag SM7steps, and you can tweet J uh, at JBear. Uh, so I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up. And again, the webinar is going to be available for replay at www.verticalmeasures.com slash webinars. We'll hopefully get that up in the next two days or so. Uh, thanks, Jay. Uh, and we'll be signing off now. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.